Brothers and sisters, God has every hair on your head numbered. And I want you to know today that every last hair, God just doesn't have it numbered, but God knows its length, its color, its density, its weight of every single hair on your head. God has got you covered. God knows you better than you know yourself. Not too long ago, I was studying through Chronicles and I was reading through these long lists of genealogies and I thought to myself with every last one of these names, some of these names we don't have any information about, but God had all the information about. Every last one of those individuals, God knew and God also had their hairs on their heads numbered. And just like God knows them, God knew them, God knows you. God knows the beginning of your story. God knows the hardship in your story. God knows what triggers you. God knows what hurts you. God knows who made you feel very special. God knows your needs. God knows your deepest desires and wants. Some people really struggle to believe in a God that knows so much and a God that cares so much and a God that loves so much. I remember talking to a non-believer. He identified as an agnostic person and I remember he was complaining because he said uh, if God wants us to believe in him so much how come God doesn't give us even more revelation he said that he would believe in God if God revealed himself to him personally and I thought to myself does this person really know what it is that they are asking for. The problem is that they do not know the power of God's holiness. They do not realize that God's holiness is very serious. See, we have account after account of people when they see God, when they see God, for instance, like Moses, when he saw God, when Moses encountered God, he could barely handle it, had a veil over his face. The text says that when he came down from the mountain, his face shone, his face shined. It was like there was beams of light shooting out of his face. According to Exodus 34, if I turn over Exodus 34 quickly, Exodus 34 and 29, let me read to you about the experience and how it shocked the people who saw the face of Moses. Exodus 34 and note 29 says that Moses came down from Mount Sinai and as he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God because he had been talking with God. And when Aaron and the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him and Moses spoke with them. Moses came down from that mountain looking scary. Moses came down from that mountain, just finished talking to God. And you, you know, imagine you're, you're there, you say, Moses, hey Moses, what did God say? And Moses' face is shining and it's like beams of light but coming out of his face, he's glowing. And I, 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 I tell you, many of us would see that and we would get up and start running away. We'll be terrified. But see, the reason why this happens is because the person of Moses himself was almost destroyed in the presence of God because of God's holiness. God is so holy that it is lethal to unrighteous people to get 
so close to him, to see him like Moses encountered him. First John 1, 5 through 10 says that the light cannot tolerate darkness. In light, there is no darkness at all. The light and the darkness do not mix. And one of the greatest tricks of Satan for just a footnote, a footnote for you. The one of the greatest tricks of Satan was to convince us that there was a gray area. That you can have, you can be in the light, you can be in the darkness, and then you can be in the gray area. And that's a lie of Satan. With God, there only is the light. There only is the light. And the gray area is the devil's territory. The gray area is the devil's world. Light and darkness cannot mix. God's holiness cannot tolerate unrighteousness. And God's holiness in the presence of unrighteousness, in the presence of a flawed man like Moses, will destroy you. And so this, this agnostic person, they did not realize what they were asking for, but they were really asking for their own destruction. You see, people don't understand this. They don't understand this when they say, why don't God just show himself to us all? Why don't God just show up in my living room and prove once and for all that he exists? They fail to realize witnessing God like Moses did is dangerous for the unrighteous. So we're going to be studying today from Exodus 3, and let's turn over to Exodus 3, starting at verse 2. Because there's something very interesting that we can learn about God, his plans, his expectations, and his providential care. I, I don't have a bunch of runs for you today. I don't have a bunch of poems. I don't have a bunch of rhyming words. I just got Bible for us today, if that's okay. The Bible says in Exodus 3, verse 2, it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. Moses was called up to the unknown and saw a burning bush, but the bush was not consumed. And out of this bush, God spoke with Moses. You know, through this symbol, God showed how he will dwell with humans. Although God is like a burning fire, he will find a way to dwell among us and not consume us. In the Garden of Eden, God found a way to dwell among us and not consume us. But you know the story, you know that sin came in the picture. And because God was so merciful to us, God said, you got to leave the garden. Because God knew what, what happened to us being sinful in his presence. And so then later on, we find the people are tabernacling. They're going from place to place. They're wandering in the desert and they're building a tent and they're tabernacling. And God found a way to dwell in the tent, to dwell in a special part of the tent that people had limited access to so that God, the consuming fire, would not consume us. We find that God tabernacled with us. God found a way to not consume us. Even in the temple, we had the holy of holies. We found a way for God not to consume us. And finally, with Jesus Christ, the word becoming flesh, God, again, finds a way to dwell among us, yet not consume us. And in the work of Christ, we find a new creation. You know, why is God doing this? Why does God do this? Why did God do this over and over? The beautiful Garden of Eden, and God walked with me, and God talked with us, and God was there with us. Yet we messed it up. But God still found a way to tabernacle with us. Why does God do that? And then tabernacle with us. And then God still found a way to dwell with us in the temple. Why does God do that? And then God still found a way to walk with us through the person of Jesus Christ. Why does God do that? And now we have a new creation. 
for those of us who have been saved can, can go to God every moment, every day in prayer and pray to God and thank God and praise God. Why does God do all of this? Because God desires a relationship with his people. But God's holiness, devoid of the work of Jesus Christ, would destroy us. So what God had to do is God has to make his people holy so that we could commune with him. Going on to verse number five, Exodus three and five, it says, then he said, he says to Moses, he says, do not come near, take off your sandals off, off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Brothers and sisters, I, I still believe that we have holy ground today. The Bible teaches me that wherever two or three are gathered, what's it say? There I am I. So that means that when we come together on Sunday morning, we are standing on holy ground because God is here with us. God's holiness comes with expectations. God said, take off your shoes. And Moses took them off. Some folks would have said, why? Why I got to take off my shoes? I got holes in my socks. My feet stink. Why? I haven't cut my toenails in a while. Why? But Moses expected the expectations that came with God's holiness. God said, take off your sandals, a word of warning. Moses must come no closer. He was standing on holy ground in the presence of God. He must show respect for the spot by removing his sandals. Sandals pick up dirt during a journey, and a person must be clean when he approaches God. And we too got to take off our sandals. One of the problems with the church today is that people don't want to take off their sandals when they come to commune with God. We come to God with our dirty, filthy shoes on and step all over something that is holy with our dirty shoes and we expect God to accept us and that filth. Take off the shoes, take off the sandals, take off the shoes of, of greed, take off the sandals of pride, take off the shoes of immorality, take off the sandals of busybodiness, take off the shoes of laziness, take off the shoes of overindulgence, take them off. Some try to walk in the presence of God and keep their sandals on. Some think, well, they can just sin as much as they like and, and rely on God's grace and Grace is like some sort of insurance policy that we don't have to pay a premium or a deductible for. Some folks go around creating fires purposefully like an arson to say, well, the insurance is going to cover my fire. But brothers and sisters, God is not all states. God is not progressive. God is not nationwide. You know, which one is that company where they where they call out the company and the company shows up. What company is that? State Farm and the commercial, they call out State Farm and they just boom, show up. But see, God, you know, you know, God is not mocked. We can't make fires and burn stuff up and be arsonists and then and then snap our fingers and say, God, show up and use your grace to put out the fires that I've started purpose. That's not how God works. God is not mocked. Romans 6 says, shall I continue in sin that grace may abound by no means? If we love God, if we want to obey God, then we will keep ourselves true to the commandments of God. We are to be holy as God is holy. I think about Leviticus 11. If you have your Bible, come to Leviticus 11, verse 44. And it reads the following, it says this. It says, for I am the Lord your God. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. You shall not defile yourselves with any swarm of creature that moves on the earth. For I am the Lord your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall be holy for I am holy. And this word holy in the Hebrew means that you shall be set apart. Set apart from the world. 
The world likes the darkness. The world likes the gray area. But when you are a child of God, you're set apart and you walk in the light as he is the light. Jesus, the light of the world. So throughout the law, we find this, be holy. And even though the law couldn't cut it, the law is still saying to be holy as God is holy. Leviticus 11.44, Leviticus 19.2, Leviticus 13 through 16, calling you to be holy, not apart from this world, to be distinct from this world. The Bible goes on to say in verse number seven, it says, then the Lord said, I surely have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of, the, of that land to good and, and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Brothers and sisters, the reason why God has a plan to fellowship with us. The reason why God has expectations for us to be holy is because God loves us. And because God loves us, God cares about his people and their well-being. And this is all a part of God's holiness. God loves us, but God knows that for us to come and encounter God, that as Leviticus has pointed out, we must be holy as God is holy. So God loves us. See, you know, all of the things. urgings for you to be holy as God is holy is not just for show. It's, it's, it's not just to give you a hard time. It's, it's, it's not just to challenge you. It's not just to make you feel bad, but it's to bring you closer to your creator. It's to bring the created creature closer to the creator God. And God desperately wants relationship with you. God told Moses, he said, he said, I know what's going on. I know what you've suffered. I know what's happened to you in the land of Egypt. I know what has happened to you. I know what you have suffered. Has anybody here ever been afraid to tell your story? You've been afraid to tell how you have suffered because you've been concerned about how weak humans are going to respond to your sufferings? Anybody been through that before? Anybody suffers with that before? You're afraid to tell them about what you've gone through, that racist boss that you had when you should have got a raise and you didn't get a raise when you didn't get the right kind of treatment in the hospital that you deserved when you when you were treated on by the legal system when the cop and got some time that the person you thought was came your Time relative to carry you became got hurt, got hurt, but you're afraid to share them because folks are too weak. Anybody been through that before? But God knows what you've gone through, God knows you're suffering, and because of that, God wants a relationship with you. Because the best place you can be in the midst of the suffering, the best place you can be as you work out.
see it, and that's creation. And I see the beautiful stars. I see God. When I when I see big lakes and I see the ocean, I see the waves crash each other. And I see the birds flying by and the seagulls interacting with each other. I see God's beautiful. They testify. When I see you and the beauty and the goodness of you and the ways that we take care of one another, I see the beauty of God's creation and your good works testify of God. I thank God. I thank God for the testimony that's all around us. What does, what does, What did God? Do? Well, with the tabernacle, God makes one person holy to interact with Him. Tabernacle. One for one person to interact with Him. But with Jesus, but with Jesus, what happened was it wasn't just one person. Tabernacle, just one person go and interact with God temple just one person at one time of the year can go interact with God but with Jesus God did something amazing because God through Jesus made a way for him to dwell with us personally and then not destroy us Jesus died to make us righteous Jesus died so that the blood of the lamb could wash away our sins and we could be made righteous something that we could not do for ourselves Well inside of us richly. So now we Christians are made righteous. And if we walk in the light, as Jesus said, it's the light. Not because we are good, but because God is so good, God has made us righteous. So like the burning bush, God has found a way to dwell in us and not destroy us. And Jesus, the consuming fire, found a way to dwell with us and not consume us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The consuming fire has found a way to dwell in us and not consume us. Acts 2, 3 and 4 says, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now the consuming fire of the Spirit can dwell in you, can dwell in us, and not consume us. Thanks to the work of Jesus Christ. So now, because God has made us righteous, we can do as Hebrews 4.16 says. It says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What a blessing, brothers and sisters.